light Take away the dark of night Fill me with your pure delight Touch me with your hand God of grace Flow into this holy place Listen as your children pray Take me as I am Healer of my heart Lover of my soul Maker of the stars, the earth, the sky Come and make me whole Savior of this world My voice praises you alone Healer of my heart Lover of my soul Praise the Lord, God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the Master's Touch Healing Service. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie. And my friends, I just want you to know that we're delighted to be able to bring these healing services to you to glorify God and to heal His children. Let me ask you, did you come expecting to receive from God today? Well, my prayer for you is this, that you do receive your healing touch from God. But let me say this, if you don't come expecting to receive, then you won't. So raise that expectation level, expect to receive, and you will. Listen, take a second right now to assemble a small piece of bread or a cracker, a bite of some kind of food, and a swallow or of some kind of beverage or juice, maybe even water. It's okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Set it aside, and we're going to pray over it and sanctify it as the body and the blood of Christ a little later on. And now these are known as the elements of the covenant, so in future services or whatever when I call for the even today when I call for the elements of the covenant this is what I'm asking you to bring forth okay you know it's imperative my friends that we usher in the Holy Spirit by invitation we do that through praise and worship and the Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people so if you don't know the songs that we're playing today then just listen to the words and let them minister to you they are all have they all have to do with healing um, and that in in Listening to those words, letting them minister to you, what you're doing is allowing the Holy Spirit to join you as we worship and sing. Body and spirit, 
Now, stop what you're doing, pull up a chair, and get ready to receive. You know, we've entered God's presence with praise and thanksgiving, and now as we dwell in God's presence, I just want you to embrace the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. Bask in His presence and open your hearts to receive Him. Sing over you is my delight. Come away with me, my love. Under my mercy, come and wait till we are still. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your precious presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. They're just open wide to receive your healing power with our love and our devotion for you flowing freely from our lips. We love you, Lord, and we adore you, and we praise your precious holy name, and we magnify you. We thank and praise you that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, and we thank you that you have already heard our prayers. We rejoice because your word tells us that all of your answers for the believer's prayers are yes and amen in Christ. We thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God, the logos word of God, and revelation knowledge. We thank you that the healing power of God is present to heal all. We give you thanks and praise for sending your only begotten son to save us and take all sickness and all disease from us. We thank you that we are healed, made whole and completely restored, and we give you all the honor, all the glory, and the praise. In the name above all names, that matchless name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. 
You know, my friends, power for healing always follows the Word of God, and that's exactly where we're going next, deep into the Word of God. So you have to participate, you see. We can't just expect God to simply do everything for us. We have to get involved. So far, we've come into His presence, and now as we soak in worship, let God hear you speak to His heart. As we prepare for His Word, open your minds and hearts, expecting to receive. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be wholly acceptable to you. Let my words be your words and your words be mine. 
and may they continually glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for many years now, I've been asking this question, do you know and understand that God can heal you? Well, do you understand that he will heal you? Then I follow those questions by telling people that they don't have to be sick. Why? Because God wants to heal you. You see that all over the, his word. And the most difficult thing about understanding that is that you must have faith in order to have him heal you. Does that sound more than uh, actually more difficult that you can accept? I mean, really. But it's true, you know. You see, the key to receiving your healing from God is to have faith. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus often said to those he healed, your faith has healed you. However, in Matthew 13, verse 58, he says, And Jesus did not do many work merit, I'm sorry, and Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So, my friends, lack of faith can stop God's healing power. Now, if lack of faith, doubt, can stop God's healing power, then faith releases God's healing power. Amen? So what we need then is faith. Well, then how do you get that faith? The Bible tells us in Romans 10, verse 17, that faith comes from hearing God's word. So it's vitally important that we understand what God's word says about divine healing. Do you reject, <clears throat> do you reject God's word? If you do, then you're rejecting his healing power. You know, it's, it's really heartbreakingly unfortunate. There are so many Bible-believing Christians out there that reject what God says about his healing power. And most of the time, they don't even know they're doing it. Their rejection is based primarily on two things, because some people don't get healed when, they, uh, healed when they pray, or because of traditional teaching, people are stuck in the rut of their past knowledge of God and his moves. Here's the point. No one has ever rejected God's healing power based solely on the word of God, because anyone with an open mind and an open Bible will become a believer in God's healing power. You know, it's clear from what the Bible tells us that Jesus healed and he healed often. Actually, you know, that two-thirds of his ministry was healing and restoration. That's right. Jesus' main ministry consisted of three things. Ready? Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Our evidence is found in Matthew 4, verse 23. So we can plainly see that healing was not a side issue with Christ. It was actually a main issue with him. Here's the question. Does Jesus still heal today? Now, according to Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah, my friends. Jesus still heals today. Praise God. You know, the Word of God tells us in Matthew 12, verse 15, that many followed Jesus, and he healed all their sick. Jesus healed all, not some or most, all. So, you know, I looked the word up, all, <laughs> in the Greek, and all means all. It's God's will to heal every believer. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find that Jesus refused to heal anyone who came to him in faith. He healed everyone who believed without exception. Here's the crux of the issue. If you don't believe something, you won't receive it. You reject it. If you believe it, you have faith in it, so you receive it. What happens then? It manifests for you. Well, will it manifest instantly? Well, it can, but most often it doesn't. You see, healing is a process and takes some time. A restoration, on the other hand, is instantaneous. Now, keep in mind that there will come a time in every believer's walk when their faith gets kind of wobbly. And what I mean by that is that they're limited in their ability to stand in faith to the degree that it takes to overcome, well, that horrible situation that's looming over them like a wave of a tsunami. So what do you do when that happens? Well, it's then that you have to realize that it isn't your faith that you need to stand on. We stand on the faith of God, the faith of Jesus Christ. So here's what you do. You ask yourself these questions when you're faced with that kind of situation. Does God have the faith to manifest my miracle? Yes, he's my creator. Of course he has the faith. Does Jesus have the faith to manifest my miracle? Yes, he's my redeemer. He definitely has the faith. Look what he did for me at the cross. Now, when you realize that God and Jesus are one entity, and they individually and collectively do have that faith, then it's their faith you stand on, not your own. Here's why. You see, our faith is limited by the level of understanding of God's word that we're on. To break free of those limitations, reach out for God's faith and stand on that. And when you do that, what you're doing is you're standing in faith for uh, uh, whatever it is that you're standing in faith for, and it's going to manifest, and you will automatically move into God's rest. Now, friends, pay close attention to this. Not only did Jesus heal everyone while he was on the earth, but to ensure our healing for today, this is what he did. He paid for it. Isaiah 53, 4 tells us, Surely Jesus took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. So there you have it. Jesus took up your infirmities. He took your sicknesses and your diseases. He took them, and since he's already taken them, you don't have to have them. Hallelujah! 
This scripture should really settle any issue on divine healing, and yet some people argue with God and seem to fight for the right to keep their sickness. Some try to find reasons why that scripture doesn't mean what it says. You know, a lot of folks will say, and I've had this said to me, this scripture is speaking about spiritual healing, not physical healing. And my answer to that is this. I don't see the word spiritual in this verse, so you're adding to the Bible. Let's let Matthew tell us what God meant as spoken by the prophet Isaiah. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken. Through the prophet Isaiah, he took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. Now, it's clear from Matthew that he interpreted the words from Isaiah to mean physical healing, since he quoted in reference to the healing ministry of Christ. You know, here's another good reason that we should have faith for healing. Sickness is darkness, and it's of the devil. Look at the word devil. Cross out the D. What do you have? Evil. That's right. Sickness is evil. It comes from the evil one. It's of the devil, and whatever is of the devil, we don't want anything to do with. Listen to Acts 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And Luke 13, verse 16 tells us that after healing a woman who was crippled by a spirit, Jesus said this, Should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free? Now, from these scriptures alone, and there are many, many others, we clearly see that sickness is not caused by God, but by Satan. And God tells us in James 4, verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, <laughs> I know I'm making this sound simple and offhand, kind of like I'm saying, well, you're not sick. And yet there, there you are with symptoms of dire sickness. Some of you are in pain and in many cases, the condition is life-threatening. However, you need to get this into your heart and your mind. We don't have to put up with anything that comes from the devil, and that includes sickness and disease, lack, poverty, I mean anything at all. Are you listening? Satan is a thief, and he's trying to steal your health, your position with God, and your healing from you. Now, I want you to see who's making you and your loved ones sick. It's the devil, not God. So the bottom line then is this. What do you believe? And when we're finished here today, what will you believe? Go with me to Matthew 9, verses 28 and 29. <clears throat> the blind men came to Jesus and asked him to heal them. And uh, what he said to them, he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? Listen, friends, God will do for you according to your faith, what you believe. If you believe Jesus still heals, and that's, that, well, that it's his will to heal everyone, including you. If you believe that he paid the price for your healing, if you believe that sickness is of the devil and that you have authority over him, oh, and by the way, you do, then you've begun your faith journey to walk in divine health. So don't tolerate sickness. You have a divine bill of rights from receiving answers to prayer to raising the dead. God has set aside for you an absolutely wonderful inheritance. Included in this inheritance is the right to good health. And God made sure of this spiritual birthright through Jesus. Like him, you have a right to prosper in your physical body. The Bible refers to you as a joint heir or equal beneficiary with Jesus. And you'll find that in Romans 8, verse 17. Although Jesus is the Son of God, he came to earth as the Son of Man, my friends, born like any other one of us human beings. His purpose was to show us the Father and then once again gather us into himself, showing us how to live supernaturally like superhuman beings in this natural world. Think about it. As a man, just like you and me, flesh and blood, Jesus possessed the power to heal the sick, lay hands on lepers, correct blood disorders, manifest new body parts, open blind eyes, cast out demons, and raise the dead. What do you think his attitude was towards sickness and disease? Well, I'll tell you, he didn't tolerate it, and you shouldn't either. So, <clears throat> um, here's the thing. Jesus was inheritance-minded. You know what inheritance-minded people are? They're completely confident in the integrity of God's Word. In simple terms, they not only believe in God, they actually believe God. Jesus' attitude towards sickness was the result of his study of the Scriptures. He knew with absolute certainty that he had every right to exercise his God-given authority in this earth. Well, so do you. So do I. Luke 4, 18, verse 18 tells us that Jesus 
uh, about his confidence in who he was, what was available to him, and what he was capable actually of doing. Jesus said this, I am empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal, deliver, and set free those who are poor of health and in bondage. So let me ask you this, what's your attitude towards sickness? Do you accept it as a way of life? You know, many believers, and actually most believers, settle for very uh, just less than God's best. I'll put it that way. Less than God's best where their health is concerned. Some have even accepted a satanic lie that God will put sickness on you to teach you a lesson. That's a lie right out of the pit of hell. How do we know? Because Deuteronomy 7 verse 15 says the Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. Think about it. What lesson could you possibly learn from getting cancer, heart disease, kidney or liver disease, diabetes, or even the common cold? Listen to me. Would you as a parent give your child a disease, make him or her sick to teach them a lesson? No, of course not. Then what makes you think your creator, who is love, would do that to you? There's no lesson to be learned from sickness and disease. My friends, you have the right to divine health, and it starts with changing the way you think and speak. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you're sickness-minded and you go around saying, I'm so sick, it looks like I'll never get over this, or if you're just one of those people who continually rehearses the symptoms when somebody asks you how you are today, then that's exactly what will happen, says Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he, because out of the heart the mouth speaks. Be like Jesus. Take a firm stand against sickness. He's already paid the ultimate price for your healing. He gave his life. Supernatural health is yours, my friends, and God wants you healed. He wants you made whole and well, and he wants you completely restored. You know, I'm sharing with you today some things in God's words that applies to receiving your healing and maintaining your healing, and I'm also going to be sharing some things with you that you may find hard to believe, but they're in the word of God for all of us to benefit from. So first and foremost, I want you to understand this. Because of Jesus' finished work at the cross, you were healed at the cross. In the book of Isaiah, it tells us, Surely he took my sicknesses and carried my pains. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. You see, Jesus took our place, and he took the punishment for all of our sin and broken covenant, all our rebellion. This included sickness and disease. He took it. He paid the price and took it specifically when he was tied to that post and was beaten. Now, people could see the soldiers beating him, but what they couldn't see were the blows that God was beating him with. While that, that beating was happening to his body in the natural realm, in the spirit realm, he was being beaten by God. Now, I want you to make a note of this, though. Jesus took all sickness, disease, and sin in his body, not in his spirit. His spirit was untouched. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 53, verse 10, says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, God, hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. By his bruise, we are healed. Okay, was it the bruises that the Romans put on him? No. It says that it pleased the Lord. God's not mean. Listen, folks, why would it please the Lord to bruise him? Because he who knows the end from the beginning could see your face, and he could see mine. Yeah, 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 but he was bearing our sins. That's right, but not in this verse. This verse says he was taking our sickness and carrying our pains, our disease. Young's literal, literal plan, translation says this, Jehovah has delighted to bruise him. He has made him sick. And another translation says it pleased the Lord to crush him with disease. You know, the beating Jesus took was horrific. Then being nailed to a cross is beyond comprehension. But that wasn't the half of it. That was just a very small part of what happened to him. What made him sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane? What made him ask God to let this cup pass? I want you to understand this. Jesus is not weak, my friends. Oh, no. Jesus is strong. And yet he fell on the ground, overcome with all the pressure of it. Why? Was he afraid? No. Because in a few hours while he was hanging on the cross, all the evil, the vile ugliness of all the iniquity and sin of all of mankind, from Adam all the way down into the future and right down to the very last man on earth, is going to converge on him. He's not going to just empathize with it. Oh no, my friends, he's going to become it. Then, 
added to all of that, God will turn away from him. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the full judgment of God for all of mankind's sin and broken covenant and rebellion has come upon him. Now, before Jesus went to the cross, he was tied to the scourging post, beaten senseless like a criminal. And the Bible says that Isaiah, seeing it in the spirit centuries before it ever happened, said what? God is bruising him. God is beating him. With each blow, God struck him with the spiritual root of every sickness and every disease that mankind is ever going to know. Jesus took that for you. So why should you have to pay for it again? After all, that's why Jesus is at the, the cross, taking your beating sin, sickness, and disease. Isaiah 53, 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, we are healed. Think about it. You know, the Bible tells us that during all the trial of Jesus, during all the time he was being beaten, this is what it says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Acts 22. Here they tied the man of God to the scourging post, just as they did with Jesus. It hadn't actually been that long after they'd crucified Jesus. And as they're tying him to the post, he, I want you to get this, he opens up his mouth and says, I want you to totally get this picture. They took off his coat, tied him to the post. He can hear that guy warming up his whip behind him. And Paul says, hey, hey. And the scourger yells, shut up. You're about to be beaten. But Paul shouts, hey, is it legal to beat a Roman citizen that hasn't been found guilty and convicted of a crime? Is it legal? Now, he knew it wasn't legal, and they knew it wasn't legal. But here's the thing. He opened up his mouth. Why? Because he knew about his rights. You see, in those days, if you weren't a Roman citizen, you were nobody. You were nothing. It makes no difference who you are, what you have. Non-citizens could be beaten and made slaves, but not Roman citizens. If you were a Roman citizen, you were someone. You had rights, and you had rights that the whole kingdom and emperor himself backed up personally. Because you had rights, you could appeal your case all the way up to Caesar, and actually Paul did. The Bible tells us that he stood before Agrippa and said, I appeal to Caesar. Paul's a Roman citizen, and he can appeal to Caesar. Why? Because he had rights. Well, I want you to know something. We have rights, too, as citizens of the United States of America. They're listed in the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. Why is this in the Bible? But more importantly, why am I talking about that in a healing message? Well, the Bible says in Philippians 3, verse 20, that our citizenship is in heaven. That means that your name is written in a book, the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, in eternity, if you aren't a citizen of heaven, no matter who you are, who your family is, how important you are, or you think you are, you aren't anyone. There's only one thing that matters. If your name isn't in that book, my friends, if you're not citizens of heaven, nothing else matters. But here's the good news. If your name is in that book, you have heavenly citizenship and you have rights. And you have those rights not when you get to heaven, you won't need them there. You have those rights right now. Now, most Christians don't know this, so they're silent. They take the stealing of their finances. They take the sickness and disease that tries to come on them and their children. They take it and they take it and they take it and they take it. The devil is stealing from them and he's beating them and they're taking it. Why? Because they don't know they have any rights. So they don't stand up or speak up for themselves. I mean, what if Paul had been quiet? What if he just sat there and said, well, you know what? I've made a lot of mistakes, and, and I guess I do deserve a good beating. Lord, help me to be strong. Help me take it like a man. You know what? If that's all you know, then the Lord will give you strength. But there's something much, much better, my friends. What did Paul say? He said, wait a minute. He opened up his mouth and said, wait just a minute. That guy with the whip is cracking it, anxious to get on with the program. He's just waiting for someone to whip and torture. He's going to flay him. He's going to flay you. So what do you say? Hey, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. That's right. You tell that devil this. It is not lawful. The devil doesn't want you to know this. He's a spiritual outlaw. He wants to take advantage of your ignorance. He wants you to be quiet and take it. Now, Paul says, is it lawful for you to whip a Roman citizen? Why? Because he knew who he was. He knew he had rights. Look, when the centurion heard Paul's protest, he stopped the whole thing. So the low-level devil comes to you, and what do you do? You open up your mouth and speak up. You tell him, no, not in my body. You're not giving me this sickness, this disease. Speak it out. Tell him it's not legal. Listen, when you're born again, you become a citizen of heaven. 
and the devil no longer has any influence over you. I'm going to say it again. When you are born again, you become a citizen of heaven and the devil no longer has any influence over you. Why? Well, because you're born into the citizenship of the heavens when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And your name then is written in a book. That book is a book of the redeemed. It's a roster of the citizenship of the eternal kingdom of God. And now as a citizen, you have rights and you have to know those rights and speak them out loud. Jesus didn't open his mouth. If he had, legions of angels would have saved him. He could have when they tied him to the post and beat him, during which time the hand of God was striking him with the core cause of every sickness and disease that mankind's ever going to know. He could have said, I appeal to justice. I'm innocent. I appeal to God Almighty. You know what would have happened if he had? We would have been, uh, uh, he would have been saved. I know that for sure. And we would have, I have to pay the price for all of our sins. He didn't. All he had to do was open his mouth and speak, but he didn't. He was totally silent. He opened not his mouth. That's what the scripture said. He opened not his mouth. He took it. Why didn't he open his mouth? He was silent so that we can open up our mouths. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Open up your mouth and say when anything negative comes and begins pounding on you, don't keep silent. Open up your mouth and say, it's not legal. Tell the devil, it's not legal for you to touch me. I am a citizen of heaven. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You speak up and the enemy will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Open up your mouth and declare that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God for this information, my friends. Praise God for our rights and heavenly citizenship. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says this, As he is, so are we in this world. The he that that scripture is referring to is Jesus. As Let's put his name in there. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Not only are you where Jesus Christ is, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but you are also as Jesus Christ is. <laughs> well, how is he? Full of perfection and life. His health is the vibrancy of his life. You know that while he was on this earth, he was never sick. He didn't have so much as a headache or a hangnail. So why can't we walk in that same vibrant health? We can, because of the profound union we have with Jesus Christ through our faith. Remember, when he found us, we were sinners and separated from God because of our sin. But now, we believers are in union with Jesus Christ, us in him, he in us. Through our faith, we are something completely new and different. The Bible tells us we're a new species, a new, new creature in Christ Jesus. Look, the Bible tells us in Genesis 2, verse 23, about God taking a rib from Adam and creating Eve. And what Adam said, he said this, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Listen to this. You need to understand this. When we are born again, we are born out of or through, if you want to call it through, Jesus Christ. And we are now, as born again believers, bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We have Jesus' DNA. We are born of him spiritually and physically restored to his supernatural health and wholeness. So watch this now. If Jesus is in us and we're in him, then all of the vibrancy of his life, all of his attributes, all of his wholeness and divine health are in us as well. When we're born again, we, like a caterpillar, make a great exchange, my friends. The caterpillar goes into a chrysalis and a supernatural exchange happens and he comes out a butterfly. Now, he remains a butterfly for the rest of his life. He can never go back to being a caterpillar. He will forever remain a butterfly. Now, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a supernatural exchange takes place. In the twinkling of an eye, we move into Christ. However, we never come out of him. We remain in Christ for all eternity. Jesus is in us and we are in him. Therefore, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So when symptoms come knocking, and you know they're going to because the enemy doesn't want you to know that it's illegal for him to touch you, you speak it out loud. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. You know, it's imperative that you understand this. When Jesus was crucified and afterward went to hell, he destroyed Satan. He took the keys to hell and conquered sin and death. He defeated the devil, took back the dominion and authority, the empowerment of God um, that was given to Adam and Eve, and, and he restored it back to us. He restored us to the blessing. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, the Roman army would vanquish their foe and then strip the leaders and captives naked, tie them together single file, and march them throughout their territory, showing everyone that they were defeated and had no power. This is exactly what Jesus did with Satan and his cohorts. 
Now, the devil doesn't want you to know that Jesus took away all of his power, so he spends all of his time roaming about like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour. Now, that would be those who still think he has power. Now, his bark is the only thing he has. He no longer has a bite. These are the only things Satan can do since then. Distract you. Take your focus off of God and move it over onto the cares of this world, and he is a master at that. And he can deceive you. He's very cunning and sneaky in his deceptions. He is the father of all lies. Be aware of the wiles of the devil. But here's the key. Write this down. He always attacks you where you lack knowledge of God's word. Then, just to make sure he contains you as a captive, he liberally sprinkles everything he does with fear. Fear is twisted faith. Remember this? The devil can't create. He can only imitate. So open up your mouth and tell him it's illegal for him to touch you. Tell him you know he has no power because Jesus defeated him at the cross. Tell him you are a citizen of heaven and belong to God. Then tell your body to line up with God's word. When you get up in the morning, you tell your body how it feels. You never let your body tell you how it feels. You have to understand this. Satan cannot give you any sickness and disease. He can't give you anything. But wait a minute. You said earlier that Satan's the one making us sick. Well, that's correct, but Satan can only offer it to you. Satan always works from the outside in, my friends. God always works from the inside out. Now, because Jesus is one flesh with you and the Holy Spirit resides in you, there's no room for the enemy. He can't even get in. So don't take sickness and disease. Well, how do we take it? We say it. We open up our mouths and we say it. Actually, this is what we're doing. We're coming into agreement with it. We agree with what the enemy says about us instead of agreeing with what God's word says about us. So the doctor gives you an evil report. Now, the doctor's not the evil one. The evil report's coming from the enemy. <clears throat> doctor gives you an evil report, says you're sick. You've got some kind of disease. What does God's word say about you? You were healed at the cross, so you can't possibly be sick. Are you getting this? What are you going to do? <laughs> I'll tell you something. The enemy wants us to believe it. It wants to have us listen to him and believe it. The flesh actually pushes us to believe the enemy. Have you ever noticed that when you don't feel well, what's the first thing you want to do? Tell someone. If you simply must tell someone that there's something wrong, tell them kind of like this. I'm under attack from the enemy and I'm fighting lying symptoms, but my healing is manifesting. That's the truth. You are under attack, but you aren't staking a claim on sickness by speaking it into your body. I'll just give you a little example, uh, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I just really actually didn't know how long I had been doing this, but I went to the eye doctor um, f several years ago because I couldn't see well. Um, my vision was blurry. I went to the eye doctor to find out what was wrong, and the eye doctor told me that I had cataracts, full-blown. I was a young woman to have full-blown cataracts, but what I really needed to have was surgery to remove them. And I thought, oh, no, no, I'm in the clergy. There's no way I have, I'm a believer. So I need to believe God that he'll take these off of me. For five years, my friends, I prayed those cataracts off of me and drove freeways to and from work without so much as a, a buy your leave. Okay. If I can do it, you can do it. The problem was that I wasn't successful because I didn't have a complete handle on it. So while I was praying it off of me and driving, fine. And when I get home, I'd forget all about it and go into the agreement of I can't see anything. So my confession negated the stuff I was doing. Now, here's the thing. I ended up having a discussion with the Lord, and he said to me that the surgery, having the surgery was just as miraculous as him healing me when I once I got it. And he actually needed me to be able to see better because he had stuff for me to do. So he said, have the surgery. It's okay. And he provided the finances because I didn't have those. My insurance wasn't the right kind. And he provided the finances from an avenue that I would never have expected it from. I had both my eyes done and I could see instantaneously. And I've been talking about it and telling people about it ever since. God decreed the length of our lives, my friends. And I want you to know this. He laid down his life for us so only to take it up again so that why? We can too. Like I said, he decreed the length of our lives in Genesis 6, verse 3, where he said that he wouldn't contend with man forever, but limited our lifespan to 120 years. That was out of God's mouth. Moses was the one who limited our life by speaking 70 to 80 years. He was just a man. Listen, no one can steal your life, my friends. You have to lay it down. Are you ready to do that, or do you still have unfinished business here? It's your choice. Okay, then, how do we maintain our healing? Very simply. 
by giving God thanksgiving. It's that simple. Thank God every time you think of it. Every time the enemy gives you a twinge, thank God for your healing. When you get up in the morning, thank the Lord for healing you. It stirs up that healing power of God in your body, and it goes to work pushing out all sickness and disease, healing you, restoring you to divine health and wholeness. Okay, right now, my friends, this might be your time to be uh, appointed by this, God's appointed for you to make a decision for Christ. How do I know? It could be. You would know in your heart. So if the Lord is speaking to your heart today, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, or if you desire to be in Christ, become a child of God and avail yourself of his healing power and marvelous wisdom, you have to give your life to him. It's very simple. It's pain-free. And in just a moment, my friends, I'm going to give you that opportunity.
to know and have a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, sincerely repent from all of your sins. Repent means change your mind and turn away from all sin. Come before the Lord with a contrite heart, which is a crushed, crippled, and broken heart, and reach out to Jesus. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. And Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future, divine health and wholeness and restoration, your protection, your direction, your provision, and your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you join me in that prayer and believe what you prayed, then you're saved. Hallelujah. Welcome to the family of God. All of heaven is rejoicing. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. Promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. And so we share in this bread of life, and we drink of His sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of the table of the king. The body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, tore for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life, paid the price. To make us one i
One of the wonderful things that we receive from partaking of Holy Communion at the table of the King of Kings is healing of our bodies and minds. I want you to listen closely. Healing can be yours just from taking Holy Communion. That's right. However, before taking Holy Communion, we have to prepare. You know, <clears throat> before we prepare, I want you to understand something about our use of the elements of the covenant. Jesus and his disciples had bread and wine on the table when they shared the Last Supper. The meal itself had come to an end, and there was still some food left on the table, some bread and wine. Now, these items were familiar to all of them because they had used bread and wine forever to celebrate the Passover. Now, because those particular items, the bread and wine, were used to draw the picture that Jesus wanted them to see, we use the same items. However, remember this, it doesn't matter what food items you use. Use what you have available to you. It's perfectly acceptable. Why? Because we pray over those items, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. And this is what I want you to see. You need to believe that they become the body and the blood of Christ. Now, the Word of God tells us that the first thing we must do is discern the body of Christ. So we do that by acknowledging that the bread or whatever food item you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus. His supernatural healing and wholeness, His attributes and perfection, which are yours, that, that because of His body and blood, you supernaturally have become bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. You have His DNA, that you are now filled with His marvelous power, completely healed, completely made whole, and completely restored to His divine health. You could think of it as medicine if you want a pill that's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. Every time you take this medicine, it's healing you as it travels through your mouth and down into your body. And it goes to what it's doing, it goes uh, as it's going down into your body, it's pushing out all darkness, which is sickness and disease. And it's pushing it out from the inside out. Visualize the condition that's plaguing you, that sickness or disease being on Jesus' body. Put whatever the ailments are on him. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, remember? So use your imagination. Now, the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it at the cross, you're already healed and made whole. So put that lying symptom back on Jesus in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself without the problem. See yourself with the solution. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vital you understand it and do it. Now, my friends, if you've been diagnosed with a problem and are being treated by a doctor, then continue your treatment and medications. But add to it your faith and your taking of the healing power of the Holy Communion that's yours for healing and restoration. Remember, too, that we believe in doctors. Don't just try to uh, mentally agree away your situations. See a doctor and get a name for what's plaguing you. Why? Because everything with a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. The next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future, as restoration of the blessing uh, to your life, that power and authority of God in your life in full operation, as receiving God's provision and protection, as receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ and thanking God for his plan of redemption and that you've even been included in it, that you have been given eternal life, life everlasting, and now you no longer live under the law. You live under His grace. Now, lift up the elements of the covenant. These are the items I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave His life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this food item becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we're continually washed in the waterfall of his precious blood and renewed within as we remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. You know, the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship, my friends. It's a partnership with Christ. And partaking of one bread creates a partnership then between the members and disciples as well. It merges us into one body, known as the church. The Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. That means take the bread, continually give thanks, break it and eat it, and then give the, take the cup and do the same thing. Drink it after we bless it, all in the remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The Lord commanded that the supper uh, be repeated often, and yet Paul doesn't give us instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, and he does, though, imply that it's to be done with frequency so that partaking of the Lord's Supper will continually recall to our minds our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. Do it as often as you want to and need to. 
Remember, too, you don't need a priest, nor do you need a minister or pastor to administer Holy Communion to you. We, who are born-again believers, are members of the royal priesthood, my friends, and therefore we have been given the authority and the right by God to administer Holy Communion to ourselves and others. Now, as we're instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you that this item of food has become the bread of life and has become the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus broken for you so that every cell, every tissue, every organ and bone, all systems, cardiovascular, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, uh, all, all systems are totally aligned with God's word and his will, that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to the divine health and wholeness of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread, or eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become our portion of the precious saving blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross for the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future and for the restoration of the power of the blessing in your life and the gift of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know, <clears throat> the Lord's Supper is a feast. It's a feast in union with the believers and the, the living Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits, and we're nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, my friends, we are eternally grateful. Now we're about to go into the spirit, lay hands on the sick and the suffering and oppressed for healing and wholeness and restoration. And this is what's going to happen. I'm going to pray over you. And as I do, I'll administer the healing power of God to all of you. Then I want you to soak in worship, listen to the words of the music and let the Holy Spirit minister to you as I pray in the spirit for your healing touch from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence, for the healing power of God that you have given us as a gift and a weapon in our arsenal to use against the enemy. We thank you that you are, uh, have given us the power to bind and loose. And Lord, we praise you, worship you, and give you honor as we bind the, de the divine health and wholeness of Jesus the Christ to our listeners. We give you praise as we lay hands on our listeners and administer the healing power of God to their bodies. And we praise you as we see that healing power coursing through their bodies, healing all sickness and disease that would try to come against them from the enemy. We praise you as we bind, in, uh, bind the mind of Christ and total restoration of mind, body, and soul to all those who will believe. And we speak their divine healing into their lives in Jesus' name. We bind the enemy and his minions from our listeners and tell demonic spirits to come out in the name of Jesus the Christ. We lift you up, Lord, and thank you for filling those vacancies with your precious Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you for healing all who are sick, oppressed of the devil, and need a healing touch from you. And we give you thanks and praise that we believers are bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, and call every person within the sound of my voice healed, made whole, completely restored, and walking in your divine health and wholeness. Amen. Healing Flowing down Liquid love Saturate me now Overshadow me oh, Touch me with your Overshadow me Whoa. Breath of heaven, breathe me Healing
Now, just a reminder, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us that we are made a new creation or new creature in Christ Jesus. So get a hold of this. We are carried completely ensconced in Christ. We are totally fused together with him. If we could see his DNA, we would be able to look at ours and see his wound up in our spirals. Every cell of our bodies includes Jesus' DNA mixed with ours. Therefore, nothing evil can ever touch us, my friends. Sickness, disease, disaster has to get through him in order to touch us. And that, my friends, is impossible. We can't be sick. Oh, sickness and disease can be offered to us. The enemy can try to get us to take it. How? By our coming into agreement with it. Remember, we are totally protected in Christ. 1 John 4 verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. That belongs to you. Now, remember what I just taught you in this lesson. The way to maintain your healing is by giving thanks to God continually. By that, I mean when you get up in the morning, the first thing, begin your day by thanking God for healing and restoration and that you are in Christ. Then you can get on with your day as usual. Throughout the day, as you think of it, give God glory for healing you and again thank Him that you're in Christ. At night before you retire, give God thanks again for the healing power of God that's in your body, coming against all attacks of the devil, keeping you healed and made whole and completely restored. Then be sure to give Him thanks and praise that you abide in the secret place of the Most High in Christ Jesus. Now raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare the healing that you have received and give thanks to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. And remember, because we are in Christ as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Of my